Not all birthdays are equal. Some birthdays are more special than others. For example, the birthday when you are finally old enough to get your driver's license. Not yet, see the sad face over here. How many more years do you have? Four, it seems like 40. Okay, but it will happen, and that's going to be special. So is the birthday when you are old enough to vote. You're excited about that. Okay, how about the birthday when you're old enough to get an adult beverage? Okay, the younger ones are excited, the parents are going, uh-uh. Okay, now it's been a long time since I have celebrated those milestones, but I have been waiting a very long time for this particular birthday today because it comes with its own theme song. And I think all of us need a theme song. So my friends, I have to wonder, in the words of Paul McCartney, will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64. You know, when I first heard that song when I was five, I thought, I thought 64. Oh my God. That, that was as old as God got, you know. <laughs> that just seemed so far away and so old. But we all have questions at different ages in our lives, and actually Paul McCartney, who was in his 20s when he wrote that, had to wonder, you know, is anybody going to be around for me when I'm 64? And I think part of that song, even though it has a nice little thing song going through it, part of that song wonders, well, by that age, will I have made a difference? Will my life have meant something to other people? You see, now here's true confession time. Sometimes pastors, in rare moments of self-pity, because we don't do that very often, <laughs> pastors sometimes wonder, have we made a difference in our ministry? We wonder, has the church made a difference? Does anybody listen especially to sermons. I see your faces. I know the answer to that one sometimes. Does anybody listen to the sermons? Does anybody listen to the lessons? Is anybody here? Now, I know that pastors are not alone in asking such questions. I know all of you in all of your professions have your own version of this pity party. Especially right now, I'm thinking about teachers. Oh, I saw one just pop up. Teachers? Teachers. Teachers, yeah, you. Teachers who work incredibly long hours trying so hard to pour all sorts of knowledge into the heads of their students. And I know that they ask these questions. Does it matter? Am I making a difference? I also know parents. Parents who give their heart and their soul to their children pray that they too are making a difference. I also know that's a question you really ask between the ages of 13 and 18. Have I made a difference? What went wrong here? Believe me, your children are asking the same question. The list goes on. You have that list for yourselves. As someone who has the privilege, and it is a privilege, of walking with so many of you all, you need to know this. You need to know that I know that you are making a difference. Beloved, each one of you are making a difference. You're making a difference because of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ has made a difference in your lives and in the world. I don't think you hear that enough. You're making a difference. Now, several thousand years ago, the prophet Joel said, a time would come when God's Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. He said, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams and visions, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's a biblical prophecy that came true on the day of Pentecost, when God's Spirit was unleashed upon the people. It's a prophecy that I get to see come to life time and time again here at Holy Comforter. 
I get to see, and I pray that you see, that God is transforming our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, turning visions into realities. Y'all, that's not just preacher talk, believe me. I know what preacher talk is. It's when preachers stand up here and go, nah, 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 nah. Kind of like the Charlie Brown teacher. Wah, 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 wah. This is not preacher talk because I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your witness. Now, the word witness has become a four-letter word for many of us. Maybe it conjures up images of street corner preachers yelling at you. Or maybe it conjures up visions of overly pious people making you feel bad. But the word witness, according to Webster's Dictionary, is first of all, a person who was present or saw something that they can tell about. That's all a witness is. You can be a witness in a courtroom. You can be a witness to a great sunset. You can be a witness to the harvest moon. You can be a witness to all the joy we had yesterday as children and parents and grandparents were playing around for our fall festival. And you can be a witness to Jesus Christ in your life. And that's simply telling people about how you see Jesus working in your life. Too often, I think, in the church, we make things so complicated. It's not complicated. All right? I mean, if you like a movie, you'll tell somebody about it. I never saw Deadpool mm -hmm. until Steve Hahn said I needed to see it. And he was terrified that he was recommending an R-rated movie to a priest. It was my first. <laughs> I had never seen an R-rated movie before. I had never heard such language. I was shocked. So Steve, I love you, but you are going to hell. <laughs> Steve was just saying, hey, I like this movie. You like Marvel Comics? Yeah, I love Marvel Comics. Go see Deadpool. Any restaurants that y'all love? Yeah. You tell people about that. You know, you want to go to this place for lunch after church. And maybe this place not so much. That's a witness. That's not hard. It's a witness. Y'all, just sharing the story of Jesus in your life does not have to be fancy. It does not have to be a Red Sea moment of, I saw the Red Sea part. It doesn't have to be a road to Damascus moment. And if you don't know what to share, you can just simply ask yourself this question. What was the moment in which I felt closest to Jesus? What was the moment I felt closest to Jesus? Maybe this day or this week. Now that's one of the questions that is asked in Curcio groups. That's a renewal group. But it's also a question that can be asked of any person or any group at any time. When have you felt the closest to Jesus? When have you felt the closest to Jesus? You see, the answer, well, that's your testimony. That's your witness. Well, the moment I have felt closest to Christ was actually yesterday at our fall festival. Now, to give you some background, about this same time last year, Mallory Halterman and Darlene and Mike Bork and a lot of others said, they want to have a fall festival. I said, sure, go ahead. Good luck. <laughs> No, but they had this vision of offering something to the community that would just be fun, of introducing ourselves to the community, that we are not uptight Episcopalians. We can be fun. We can laugh at ourselves. We can laugh at the priest. And so they wanted to have a festival, and yesterday, something that was a vision just a year ago became a reality. So where did I see Jesus? Well, I saw Jesus and a number of people who came together to get everything ready to share something of who we are with the community around us. I saw Jesus in Duncan Kolsch. Is Duncan here today? No. That's because he's at home recovering. <laughs> That's our couple of people. Duncan was the Dunkey in the Dunk booth. 
And he was one of several others. Nathan Suggs was one. Pat Carter was one. I was not. Um, yeah, well, there's a story there. But, uh, <laughs> but Duncan allowed himself time and time and time again to get dumped, to get soaking wet. And he climbed out of that with a great big smile. And we all loved it. And in doing that, I saw Jesus. Where else did I see Jesus? <laughs> I saw Jesus in Jenny Fry. I saw Jesus in Jenny. Because Jenny, if I understand the story correctly, you had no earthly idea how to make balloon animals. Okay. <laughs> All right, you hear that? There was gonna be a carnival. She wanted to make balloon animals. She had never done that before. So Jenny learned how to do that. And you sat and you made balloon animals and you had a lovely headdress at one point. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what it was, but it was lovely. <laughs> and again, the children came. The parents came. And when I saw Jenny do that, and also when I knew your backstory, I saw Jesus. That was Jesus present. She was doing something for the children so she could make them laugh and make them smile. Beloved, I want you to remember that Jesus loves children. He loves laughter. And Jesus was present yesterday in all of those shared moments. Those are important moments. It may seem something small to you. It's important. Because too many times when people see churches today, what they really see is a place of hypocrisy and a place of judgment. So yesterday and this morning, we get to share the really real Jesus of the Gospels, the one who loved and laughed and enjoyed nothing more than sharing hot dogs and popcorn with people. That's in the great version of the Gospels. <laughs> you just have to read it closely. There was another moment that brought me close to Christ. And actually, it was just sitting down and hearing the testimony of Judy Smith yesterday. Judy was part of our prayer team. She made herself available to anybody who might want to pray while they were at the festival. Imagine that. You have a dunking booth on one end and prayer team on the other. The two were not mutually exclusive, perhaps. Judy doubted whether anybody would take advantage of coming up and having somebody pray with them. And she told me that. She thought, you know, I'm just going to be sitting here for a couple of hours. Well, then I went around and I was doing priestly things, like eating popcorn. <laughs> and I went back and I saw her a little bit later and she had a glow about her. She had the biggest smile on her face. And I said, what happened? And Judy said, well, any number of people have come to pray here. She said that some people did come and they were asking for prayer, but some were just pleased to have an opportunity to say a prayer, especially the children. She had children coming up and just saying prayers with her. Can't you see Jesus there? And when I was hearing her story, I realized I was standing on holy ground because Jesus was present. Not two minutes after that encounter with Judy, I got to pray with a couple. They had received unwelcome news about a loved one. So we sat here in the sanctuary, and here, in the midst of tears, Jesus was present. What an honor that was. Now, y'all, it's just taken me a couple of minutes to share some of these experiences, but what you have been hearing is a witness. It's a testimony from one particular day that happened over a couple of hours. Now, how terrifying was that? How threatening was that? Did you feel you were in a spook house hearing these stories? No, because these are stories of grace. They're stories that need to be shared. Like I said earlier, we do not share these stories often enough. You do not know often enough what an impact you are making in this corner of the world. Now one of the recent graces we've had here at Holy Comforter is to hear other people's witnesses. And I know this happens a lot informally. I know it happens in small groups. 
I know what happens when we hear stories of faith that make us smile or nod our heads in recognition, or maybe stories that bring a tear to our eyes. But we've also had witnesses the past couple of weeks during our stewardship campaign, shining in your life, I have been so touched, so touched. In a little bit, you'll hear another story from Tab Carter. I've been touched by Teresa and Holly. I've been touched by Carolyn. I have been touched by the Cardinal family. They've been sharing stories of Jesus. And I've loved the honesty of these testimonies. Not one person has stood where I am standing and said, since I have turned my life over to Jesus Christ, I have no problems. No one has said that. But what each person has said in one form or the other is how the presence of Jesus in their lives has made all the difference in the world in their lives and the lives of others. That's an amazing grace that each one of you can share. And each of these persons are also a realization of the prophecy from Joel that I referenced earlier, when Joel said a time would come when God's Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. He said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and visions. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Beloved, I want you to dream big. Big. I want you to have visions that are so enormous, only the community of faith coming together can make that a reality. Now, almost 20 years ago, when I was gathering the group together for what would become Holy Comforter, I shared a prayer with them, and I want to share it with you today, and I want you to make this prayer yours. It's a prayer that's been attributed to Sir Francis Drake. Remember your history? No. Okay, so when you go back, <laughs> not right now, Google Sir Francis Drake, okay? You should know this name. No, not right now. Thank you. Thank you. Be gone. <laughs> um, but I refer to this prayer frequently. Anytime I become complacent, and any time I need to be challenged. Let us pray. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dream too little, when we arrive safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we've lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery. Where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Amen. Amen.